Okay, so can you tell me a little bit about the imagination you had to get from creating these books? The characters, the plot line, the climax. The book has to be original, otherwise it'd be plagiarism, right? But why you decided to write the plot line that you did, and what subconsciously influenced that decision? What would you say in terms of the creating process? What's your biggest challenge? One day you can be writing like four pages and no problem, and the next day you're not writing for everyone. That's that's interesting. Like. Well, the magic thing, right? Like, um, it's so limitless and, and you never know where it's going to take you. What's going on, Meeting Gold listeners? It's Chris Patagli, 416 Coffee. Use the coupon code Meeting Gold to get 10% off your first order at 416 Coffee. Enjoy the show. Okay, so can you tell me a little bit about the imagination you had to get from creating these books, just in terms of the characters, the plot line? The climax, like break down, because I know, I mean, I don't know too much about English. English class, I think, taught you a lot about books yeah, and, yeah. and just in school, like the basics. Can you break down where you get that storyline from and where that motivation comes from? For sure, yeah. I'd say I've definitely been inspired by the books that I read growing up, um, especially in the fantasy genre. Um, like as a kid, I loved reading Harry Potter and, and Percy Jackson and um, series like that, and they just kind of stuck with me. Um, and obviously, like, the book has to be original, otherwise it'd be plagiarism, right? But I definitely got a lot of um, inspiration from these stories just because they're so unique and they're so um, captivating because they have, like, millions of readers all over the world. So I wanted to um, not mimic them but kind of see if I can put my own spin on that storyline. Yeah, uh- from what I was reading, um, from the back of, I believe it was the Sword of Sorinth, or sorry, I think it was the Jewels of Fate. I was reading the back of the book, and I was kind of, I was trying to dissect why you decided to write the plot line that you did, and what subconsciously influenced that decision to do so. Do you think there was like some thought behind what you were writing about in terms of replicating to your personal life? Uh, yeah, for sure. Maybe not entirely intentionally but I wrote the sort of Sorenth over COVID um, like I started right when COVID hit and uh, it just published last week so I would say like the events of the past three years definitely played somewhat of a role in it like the book deals with things like isolation um, and you know um, finding people that you can trust and things like that and I feel like at some point or another we've all experienced those experiences like through COVID. Yeah. I think, um, you know, everybody has their own vice. I guess a lot of people say is like the one thing that they really struggle with. Um, what would you say in terms of cr- the creating process, what's your biggest challenge? Definitely writer's block. Um, one day you can be writing like four pages and no problem. And the next day you're staring at a blank screen for hours. Um, and it's so unexpected, like it creeps up on you. And uh, there's so many psychologists and scientists who have uh, ways to, you know, beat writer's block and, and fix things like that. But it's really like, it's really personal to you, like depending on your circumstances, um, the story itself. Like, um, so because it's just so unknown and so unexpected, it definitely is the biggest challenge for me personally. What's um, in your childhood... Because I think childhood represents a lot of who somebody is in terms of what they come out to be, especially at a young age like yours and, and mine. What's an emotion that you craved so much as a child that you get to put into your characters in the book? That's a tough question. Uh, <laughs> Would you say that it's... Um, more subconscious in the sense that you don't really put thought into <clears throat> the the feelings that your characters feel compared to what you felt or have you com- like you've completely separated the both realities I try to separate them uh 
but like I said, like in, unintentionally, probably uh, it sneaks in there. Um, like I think how these characters react to their problems is how I might react to my problem, right. even though they're like two completely different things. Like um, it's a fantasy book. So obviously it's, it's make believe and, and fiction and like about 99% of this book, like couldn't happen in real life. Right. But at the same time, like how the, the characters respond, it's um, pr- at least somewhat probably an internal reflection at some point or another in my life um, of experiences that I went through as a kid growing up. Do you think most writers um, separate the realities? Like, because I think of, a, of an esteemed writer like J.K. Rowling, right? Do you think some of that, because what I'm trying to get at is like, I want to understand writers and their imagination, it just seems to be so much more grand. And it, somebody who's able to write down their dreams, because that's how, kind of how I look at it. Yeah, somebody yeah. who has a skill to remember and write down their dreams and create a whole plot, a story that somebody would truly be interested in, how does that reflect and portray to their personal life? So then for you, like when you're writing the plot and the climax, is a lot of this stuff predetermined or is a lot just as you're writing you make up those decisions so when i started i spent about five to six months plotting the outline and and fixing it up and and making changes and then when i got into the writing process i still changed things like the ending that i outlined three years ago for the sword of sorenth is not the ending that i ended up writing for it like i completely changed it so I like to think that I'm going to outline it and know exactly where the story is going, but uh, you end up changing things along the way, and, and it's just how you feel about it then and how you feel about the story now and where you think, like, how you think you could captivate readers even more. Do you get a lot of opinions on your books before, you, like, family, friends, and whatnot before you dive into it, or do you trust your own gut? I get a lot of opinions, but I don't hear the opinions till mm, after it's written. So I don't let anybody see my stuff until at least the first draft is written. Um, and most of the time when I've gone through it a couple of times, just to make sure it's not horrible, that I'd be scared if someone read it. <laughs> is there a sense of like um, fear when you publish a book? Like what's oh, everybody yeah. going to think? Oh yeah. Like nerves? There must be. Oh yeah. There's so many different versions of fear when publishing your book. Like you're worried about, um, are you going to make back all the money that you invested into it? What are people going to think about it? Um, are people going to want to read it? Like things like that. Like it's so many different things that you, um, worry about, but ultimately like you just got to go for it and know that, um, the book will find the right people. And, um, every book has people who love it and people who hate it. And that's just the way it goes. Yeah. Yeah. What, what was it like for you when you finished the book? That, that first feeling of finishing a book, knowing that you're done? Or is there, because I think, <laughs> it's going to be silly how I compare this, but um, when we were building out the studio, yeah, I feel like there's never an official like done date. Like there might be a published date when you start to have people in the studio or a published date when you publish the book. But is there ever like that, that oh, I'm done this book? It's never truly done because as soon as you hit publish, the next thing is you got to market it, especially as self-published mm. authors. You don't have a publishing company behind you, so you got to do all the work yourself of getting it out there, getting yourself in front of people, um, booking vendor shows or author events or things like that, booking interviews or podcasts. Um, so there's a lot more work that comes after you hit publish. Um, but for me, there was... Um, definitely a sense of excitement the moment I published the first time uh, because it was just, it was my first time and I never been through that whole process before. And it was just so cool to, to look back on, on all the years that I put into it and how far it's come. Right. What authors inspire you? Uh, Definitely uh, JK Rowling. I know she's in a bit of hot water right now with the media, but uh, I, like I said, I love the Harry Potter series growing up. Um, pretty much, oh, I don't know. I've got, there's probably so many, right? There's so many. I can't list them all. Like, uh, I read a lot. I've got a lot of books on my shelf and, um, yeah, there's just 
so many series that I like, and then I'll look at the author's life and, and um, see how they wrote a book through their own challenges, and that's also so inspiring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, do, you, um, do you get a lot of inspiration from books? Because for a lot of writers, if, for, I think this is going to really cater to the writers of the world. When you are writing the book, do you look to inspiration from other books, like a musician would maybe another song? Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Like, percentage-wise, like, do you look to it, like, half of the time, or are you more so just, like, keeping in the back of your mind, or are you constantly looking at maybe a Harry Potter book or something like that for your inspiration? Um, it's, it's always on the back burner, I guess. Um, just always thinking, like, if you're having a rough day, like, if this author can do it, so can I. Um. Like, I always think of the story, uh, J.K. Rowling got rejected by 26 different publishers before she got signed with Bloomsbury, and and now, like, her series has sold millions. Um, So, you know, little stories like that that keep you going and and make you realize that, yeah, everybody faces challenges, everybody has rough days, but those rough days will end, and if you keep at it long enough, you will will see it through. So, what's a book that you so desperately want to write? but don't necessarily know if you're ready for it. I will be on this series. I am considering more like YA um, that's geared towards a more specific audience. Um, like the nice thing about the Jewels of Fate and the Sword of Sorath, it's it's fairly open in terms of who can read it. Um, like I know grandparents or parents have bought it for their uh, younger grandchildren. I know many adults who have read it. Um, but the next series that I want to write, I want to kind of personally challenge myself to write towards a more, um, specific audience. Um, but then obviously that comes with, you know, you got to write more, um, efficiently. You got to write more for that demographic. It's not, you're not writing for everyone. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Like I, I would consider like when Drake got into the music industry, Mm -hmm. he targeted, what would do well at clubs, like exactly, nightclubs. Yeah. And it was genius. Nobody ever thought about it because he was niching down so much. Yeah, it's a marketing tactic. So for you, is it more important to niche down to a set specific group or is it more important to keep that broad scale? Or do you think that kind of relies on like if you had the, the when you have the name carry of like a JK, you, anything you write might have a lot of proof. For sure, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure there are kids who read YA and there are, you know, some, uh, you know, adults who love kids' books. Like, it's never set in stone. Like, what you write is only for that demographic only. Um, but I think it's it's important to be niche to a degree because if you're not writing for everyone, or sorry, if you're writing for everyone, you're not writing for anyone and it's just out there like it's all over the place or can be at least yeah Um, but when you niche down it helps you hone in on your target audience and then not only are they more receptive of it but it's easier to find those kind of people like if you know you're writing for a YA audience um, or like 18 and 19 year olds then you're going to quickly realize where the 18 and 19 year olds are buying their books from and then Mm. that helps you after the publishing process in the marketing. So if I were to write a book, what would be the first step that I would take? Uh, there's no... Uh, blueprint? There's no blueprint. No, it's it's back and forth, up and down, all over the place. I would say uh, figure out your genre and learn about your genre by reading in that genre because mm. I know that's helped me a lot. Um, and then uh, the next step would just be right I guess like people think that just start just start like there's never a perfect time and and you're never gonna be a perfect writer and and you're never gonna look at your work and think oh this is 100% like have 100% confidence in it there's always gonna be a little bit of worry and a little bit of doubt but when you start that's when you start getting better at it and the more you practice then the better off you'll be I have to applaud you because to write a whole book that is like starting a business plan, finishing a business plan, starting the business, 
all heavily investing your time and efforts and money into something that you don't even know if it's going to work. Yep. And there's, it's, it's probably so hard to, to test if the idea that you have for the book is viable or not. Is it not? I mean, you could ask people, um, but experts say never ask your family for your opinion or their opinion on your books. It'll never leave. They'll tell you it's great, like, because they're your family. Um, right. Yeah. Or they'll, they'll rip it apart. Like, <laughs> there's no middle ground. It's either one area or the other. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so can you walk me through, um, let's focus on The Jewels of Fate, because this was your first book. Yep. Um, there's probably, I mean, it's a big book. How many pages is it? The Jewels of Fate is about 400 pages. That's, that's a big book to write for your first book. Can you take us through like a summary of the characters, um, what they represent, and then the plot line? For sure, yeah. So I'll hold up the cover here. So the main characters are on the front. Um, so you've got Chuck. He is the main character. He starts out in New York like a normal kid, um, but then he quickly realizes that magic is real. And not only that, but the queen of this mystical world called Akinasia has summoned him to carry out a secret request. Um, and then you've got Kayleen, who is the queen's daughter, and she is the rebellious princess who does not want to follow orders and kind of stay in line like the rest of her family has for generations. She wants to do her own thing and find her own way of protecting her kingdom. Um, then you've got Ryan. He is the bookworm. Um, he is the, Chuck's best friend and the one Chuck always goes to when he needs advice or information about whatever because Ryan's brain is just so huge he can absorb any information like a sponge and you've got Dakwa who is um he's also from Akinasia but he is more laid back he's not really concerned with much he just wants to you know live life and enjoy life party you know eat <laughs> meet girls all of that um and then you've got Kimmy she is there for one reason um she's there to fight and she will fight anyone who gets in her way um, so she's very scrappy and resilient and, uh, personally one of my favorite characters to write, um, just cause I think she's so cool and, and so, um, so I don't know what the word is like, out, out there, out there. Yeah. You have so many different, um, what I think is interesting. You have so many different characteristics of each character. Like it's almost like, um, like the show friends, right? Everybody yeah. plays a role and complements each other in creating a storyline. Was that your goal from starting? Sort of. So the reason they're all so different and they complement each other in a way is because um, in Akinasia, there's this system of magic where you belong to one of five fields of magic. And basically what that means is you have certain powers and certain abilities that um, others might not have. So each of the five main characters, they represent one of the five fields of magic. So they all have different powers and abilities and that's what makes them different from each other and their personalities too. So there's, there's these levels yep. of, soci of society. Yep. Interesting. D do you think like <clears throat> when, you were, when you were writing the book, um, why, why magic? Like what draws you to magic? I think because of its possibilities. Like it's, when you write a book with magic, there's no telling where it's going to go because it's so, um, like, you can do anything with magic. You can, you know, build stuff, um, create things, destroy things, grow things. Like, it's, uh, it's very limitless in terms of how you can use it in the story. So I was really drawn to uh, magic just because of the way it could influence the story and, and how how far I could take it. Hmm. And I noticed like in, in, on the cover, I love the cover, by the way, you have a very um, animated, would that be the right word? Like yeah. cartoonist mm -hmm. look. Was that just your vision from the start or did that kind of come through as you were writing? Well, so the illustrator is a good friend of mine, OK Lozier. And uh, when we were talking about how we wanted the cover to look, we decided on this kind of cartoony look, not because the book is cartoony, mm. um, but because we thought it would bring out the characters more. Interesting. 
So do you um did you write this book to target a set sp- like a specific audience or did you write this because this was just the audience or the the um story that you wanted to tell? A bit of both. Okay. Expl- can you explain that? Yeah, for sure. So um well I'm 20 years old so I fall into the young adult category. Um and I wrote this book. I call it young adult middle grade because Um, like I said before, it's kind of open in terms of who can read it and it falls right on the border of, um, young adult and middle grade. So that's why I think the cover is so great because it plays to both sides. Like I can bring the cover. Oh, okay. So you're adhering to like both viewpoints. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even though like at the same time, it's so blended, like it's very, um, it's not black and white it's very gray but um, in terms of the story I always wanted to um, write about people my own age or my own age when I started writing this um, because that's another thing that fascinated me I wanted to see um, like there's so many stories of you know teenagers who are the heroes in books, you know, like Harry Potter, Percy Jackson. And like I said before, I kind of wanted to put my own spin on that. Yeah. And I, so I was going to ask like, why fantasy? So you love JK Rowling. You absolutely love the, the, the Harry Potter series. Why fantasy? Well, the magic thing, right? Like um, it's so limitless and, and you never know where it's going to take you. Um, and also there's just so many cool things about fantasy that draw me to the genre um, like the mystery, you know, the medieval kind of castles and yeah, dragons yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and things like that. Um, so it's definitely, it's not a boring genre at all. So it, it's so um, exciting and captivating and, and it drew me in. So I, I hope uh, it draws others in th- too through my books. As a writer, you seem to have gotten a pretty early start on, on, on writing books. There's people mm-hmm. who go the school route. There's people who go and just, Right? Right. Hope yep. for the best. What would you say is the best way to do, go about it as a writer? So for me, I'm also currently in school. I'm a university student at Brock. Taking, and you wrote a book. Yes. <laughs> yes. It, uh, that must have been pretty stressful. At times, yeah. Super stressful. But no, totally worth it because um, I'm taking English and creative writing at Brock. And not only has it helped me hone my skills, but it also offers like more opportunities to push my book out there. Um, like I was able to show it to my creative writing professor and, and actually last year when I took a creative writing class, I um, sampled the first two pages of the Sword of Sorenth to my class and they gave me feedback. Um, so shout out to anyone who is in that class. You kind of, kind of made the book a thing. Um, by helping me with the first chapter. So I appreciate that. So that was a really cool experience. So I would say school isn't completely necessary, especially for something at like writing, um, because you're never guaranteed, you know, a like career. Like an entrepreneur route, right? Yeah, yeah. You're never guaranteed um, a six-figure salary when you graduate, when you're a writer. Like you have to build yourself up. Yeah. Um, but I would say school does help you learn the craft, um, meet people like-minded like you and um, also offers opportunities to help you push your book out there. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it, like a networking opportunity. Yeah, for sure. Um, You were doing some book signings as well. Yep. That's huge. So I've What's that like? Really cool. So since COVID lightened up and the world's opened up a bit more, um, there's been so many opportunities for book signings and book events. Uh, I just did one yesterday, which was really cool. Um, I've worked at, uh, I've done a book signing at chapters. Um, I've been, uh, in Mississauga. I've uh, had the opportunity to travel a little bit throughout the Niagara region and beyond, which is really cool. Um, and also as a writer and as a university student, you spend so much time on your computer, right? So any excuse not to be on a screen, like I'm all for it. Like, yeah. so just to be in front of people talking, yeah, real people and interact with your customers and, um, sometimes you'll meet someone who has read your book and then they'll tell you what you think they think about it, whether for better or for worse. Uh, but that's always a cool experience. So are you on to your next book already? No. <laughs> I was going to say, so at what point, because I feel like once you write a book, you have to go and market that book. Yep. 
you can market it till the day you die. It might not sell. So at what point do you say, okay, it's time to write a new book, try to get new opportunity out there, try to get, uh, uh, I guess, another baseline for your marketing? Because like just thinking about that now, that's so overwhelming to think about. At what point do you not scrap, but in a way stop trying to spend money marketing that book and put your time towards something else now? Well, I can't say for certain because I'm working on a series right now. So either way, like whether I'm promoting the third book or the first book, it's it's still promoting the series. It's still promoting the series. So I, I would say if the book is not selling um, and you want to try writing um, another one, go for it. Um, I wouldn't just say leave it, leave it for dead and then never touch it again or never mm-hmm. tell people about it. Like you always want to, if you've written a book, you always want to, keep pushing it at least a little bit. Um, but if there's no momentum happening and and you want to try something else, I would definitely say put more focus into the next book um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, when you publish another book, that not only draws eyes to your newest book, but your oldest book too. So Because uh, you, people yeah. get that base yeah. from like what you've written prior. Exactly. So if they see... Um, you have a new book and they've never read your first book, they might go back and read your first book first. Even if it's not a series and it's just a bunch of standalone novels, um, if people are interested in you as the author, they will check out all your books. So that's one reason I would say try another book. Um, Another reason is you might not have found your genre or your audience yet. So if you are not a middle grade writer um, and you're trying to write a middle grade novel, but it's more geared towards YA, um, you're probably a YA writer and should stay away from middle grade and focus more on the young adult side of things. That's actually really insightful for, uh, for, for new writers. Um, where do you get most of your creative inspiration from? Not talking in terms of outside external resources. I'm talking about yourself in what situation, where do you have to go? You know, sometimes I'm working at Starbucks because I like being around people. Yeah. Yeah. Like where do you go to write a book, to have the most creative flow and not be so overwhelmed with, I guess, writer's block. For sure. So I'm one of those people that I have to have a set spot. Um, Like I can't move around. Like both my parents, they have to move around when they're working, like every hour or so, otherwise they're not going to be productive. Me, that would kill my productivity. So I I write at my desk in my room um, there's tons of space there. It's for the most part, it's quiet when my door's closed and my family's not always around. Um, but yeah, I like to stay in one spot because that it's, it's like a, it's almost like when I'm sitting there then my brain's like, okay, it's time to write. It's time to get to work here. Like, let's be productive. Um, and then when I'm not there, that's when I'm not thinking about writing. So it, it that's, what's really helped me. What do you, because most people will call you crazy. You're sitting there spending time. Some people would say wasting time, right? It's especially people who don't see the overall vision. Yeah. And I'm sure you've gotten that, right? I, I'm sure a lot of people who oh, are yeah. in those situations of spending time on something, any entrepreneur, any business owner, which you are, going out and just spending time on something that's not even maybe from the start paying them, you know, X amount of money or good enough for somebody else. What do you do with that? How do you block that out? And and you must l- just love writing that much to keep pursuing the next best thing. For sure, yeah. It's definitely a challenge, especially when you're not seeing um, any return on your investment initially. Uh, but But like I said before, if you keep pushing at it hard enough, you will eventually see a return on investment. Um, so when I was finishing the Sword of Sorenth and I was putting all my time and energy into that, um, in the last few months, it did become like a full-time job, except with the book not being done, there's no, um, there's not a lot of income coming in. I was just relying on what I was getting from my first book. Um, but the nice thing was once the second book comes out, then you're like, okay, this is, this is going somewhere now. Then you start to see, um, the investment coming back. So that makes it like worth it then. Yeah. Do you, I asked um, a gentleman this on our last episode. I said to him, I said, when do you stop? 
if you do. So Tyler, I want to ask you, at what point do you say, do I have to give up? I'll be honest, the thought did cross my mind like quite a few times over the years. Um, but it's, I would say it's important to have people that you trust and that you'd want to listen to around you. Um, so I have faced lots of criticism and, um, what, what I do is I think, where's the criticism coming from? Is it coming from someone that I, that I trust and knows about the craft of writing and knows what it's like being an author or do they have no clue what they're talking about? And if both answers are no, then I'm, why, why would I listen to their criticism? Um, but on the flip side, I think it's definitely important to listen to the people that you do trust because they, um, they will criticize your work, but not in a way that's meant to belittle you, but in a way that's meant to make you better. Um, I, I've never heard a story of somebody close to them telling them to give up. I don't, I hope that wouldn't happen. Um, but like I said, it's, you got to keep trying until you find your right genre, until you find your right niche, um, and keep pushing at it. Is the future end all be all goal, um, you know, have a book that just hits at home and, and then go from there and then just keep writing and, and just keep loving what you do? For sure. Yeah. So, um, my personal goal is to be able to live off of the money that I make writing, um, I think that's every author's goal, um, unless you're doing it as a hobby or maybe you just want to write a book for your kids or grandkids, which is great. Like everybody has their own um, different reasons. Um, I would say it's a tough question. Yeah. Well, because I want you to think like the whole point is of this show is to, is to really think in advance and in appreciation for where you're at now because you are going to grow from here. And I can tell that you, you don't have any plans on stopping or, or not writing yeah. anymore. You might have to, <clears throat> excuse me, you might have to get a side job or do something like oh, that. Yeah, like for most sure, people for sure. do as an entrepreneur yeah. when they start. But eventually, if you just keep going, it, it's going to hit a home run. Is that, your men, is that your mentality around what you're doing? Just keep pushing forward and keep going until something hits? Yeah, I would say um, it's always going to, grow like I don't think people have uh, one big break and then they're set for the rest mm -hmm. of your life like that's very rare for that to happen um, but eventually like the small wins will turn into big wins which will turn into bigger wins so it's it's all about growing um, and learning like learning as a young person and um, appreciating where you are now in terms of um, realizing that you already have come so far and that you've got um, so much more left to live. Yeah. It's, it must be so hard. Um, and I mean, this is in life in general, but to not compare yourself to another writer. That's tough. Yeah. Like, oh, I wish I wrote that book. Oh, yeah. that's not a hard book to write. The storyline isn't even that good and it has more views. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, uh, I've read books and I've read series that have sold – millions of copies and I'm thinking to myself I'd give this like two stars at best like this is not this is literature like what is this yeah. um so it's it's really tough not to compare yourself to people I know I've struggled with that in the past um but uh at one point or another every author started with a blank page and they started with no followers they started with no like sales and they grew from there. Just, just like everybody else. Just like everybody else. It is, it's actually crazy to think about that, isn't it? Like somebody started the exact same as you. Like, uh, for example, Elon Musk started the same yeah. as no vision yeah. on, you know, maybe some of the businesses that he had. And then all of a sudden he starts to have this idea and it grows and it grows and it consumes him to the point where he chases it and reinvests everything he has, his time, yep. himself, his money, and he makes it. Yeah. What's your, um, like, what's your advice? If you could, if, you, if you're preaching to a thousand authors right now, and maybe you're looking, you know, 10 years down the line when you have a little bit more experience, right? What advice would you give to somebody who wants to start writing? 
I would say go for it. Um, I really try and um, push to people that you don't have to be a certain age to do something like write a book um, just because it is more experience-based than anything else. Yes, you can go to Brock University and get an English degree or uh, business school and get a business diploma, but um, ultimately these kind of entrepreneurial ventures are experience and when you start that's you're one step closer to making it and um, having your first big break so I I would always say like if you want to do it uh, I mean you have to want it Um, and it does take a lot of work and a lot of drive but uh, don't wait 10 years or or think that you know life has to be perfect for you to start because it's never going to be perfect yeah what was um what was young Tyler thinking about writing Ooh, uh, how young are we talking? I'll give you eight years old. Eight years old. Wow. Okay. Um, so at eight years old, I would have just been writing chapter books or or no, no reading chapter books. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think when I was eight, I was reading the Hardy Boys series. (laughs) I think that was my favorite series at that age. Um, and I remember thinking, um, it'd be so cool to get a publisher and publish my book. Uh, Cause I didn't, I didn't know anything about self publishing or, or honestly how that's a better option in my opinion. Um, but at that age, when I started learning about writing and was reading more, I wanted to eventually get published by a publisher. And that was, that was everything that that's what consumed you at an early age. And then it slowly grew to be yep. writing a book. Yep. And now you've got your book on Amazon. Yep where people can purchase, where can people get that? Um, so you can buy the Sword of Sorenth and the Jewels of Fate on Amazon. Um, because the Sword of Sorenth is so new, it's not quite available in any bookstores yet, but the Jewels of Fate is. You can get it at Thistle Bookshop, um, Forget-Me-Not Gift Shop, um, The Right Bookshop. So many he can't even remember. Oh, there's quite a few. Um, Someday Books, there's a thrift shop in Niagara Falls that carries it. Um, where else? If you're like in the school board or, or if you're going to school, it's available in a number of schools throughout the Niagara region. Um, I can't quite remember the names. That's so cool though. Now that your book is, is places where people can, random people can truly be yeah. inspired by your story. That's, that must be crazy to think about a little bit, right? That, that is cool. And I have met people who I had never met before. And then they, they come up to me, like maybe I'm at a show or something. And they're like, Hey, I read your book. I'm like that. That's just, wow. that's, it blows my mind. It's just, it's the coolest feeling. It must be rewarding. And eventually it'll be everybody on the street. That's we'll, the goal. We'll see. we'll see. We'll see. That's the goal. Hey, Tyler, we're going to wrap it up today, but thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. I appreciate your time. And, uh, I'm going to have to get, I'm going to have to, which, which book would I have to read? Because it is a series, I'm assuming I yeah. should read the first one. Yeah. So the Jewels of Fate is the first one. I would never like say you can't read the Sword of Sorenth on its own, but uh, you'd probably understand more if you read the Jewels of Fate first. Interesting. Okay. Well, thank you so much. No problem. Appreciate it. And for everybody watching and listening, thank you for tuning in and uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe and let us know what questions we should ask other golden guests like Tyler as well. We'll see you later. Bye.